Okay, so today's video will be short. I just want to talk about the differences between co-dominance and incomplete dominance versus what we talked on the last video, which was what would be considered complete dominance. Where if I had a big R, a little R, um, the flower would be red. It wouldn't be pink, it wouldn't have polka dots or anything like that, it would be red. So what we're talking about is um, things in this uh, that would be a little bit different, where one is not completely dominant over the other. So the first thing we have here is what's called co-dominance. So in co-dominance, we've got both alleles are expressed. Okay, so with a co-dominance situation, I've got, usually it's a multiple allele situation. So I've got more than just the two alleles. Okay, so I've got multiple alleles and more than one of them is what is considered dominant. Okay, so um, our best example of this here is blood typing. And if you're gonna see an example of this, this is what you would see. So with blood typing, I have three alleles that are responsible for blood typing, okay? And so uh, two of them are dominant. So we pick a neutral letter, since one is not like, you know, we had red versus white, and red is dominant over white, so we picked R. Well, in this case, we've got one is dominant, uh, two of them are dominant, so we choose a neutral letter, and uh, in this case, it's the letter I. And so the alleles for blood type are I, superscript A, big I, superscript B, and a little i. Now a person still has only two of these alleles. If you look up here in this little chart here, I've got a genotype of big I A, big I A, or big I, I A, little i. So the person still only has two alleles. But in this instance, instead of just having two to choose from, there are three to choose from. And two of them are dominant. And so if those two are in the genotype, like for instance here, where I have IA, IB, then both of them will be expressed. So let's take a look at how this happens. Okay, so what I have here are different kinds of red blood cells. And so red blood cells produce what are called antigens. Okay, and so antigens are surface markers. Okay, they're on the outside of the cell. Okay, and so they're on the surface of the cell and they mark the surface of the cell. And so Type A blood cells have A antigens, or A surface markers. You can see that happening up here. Okay? It's got A surface markers. So people that have type B blood have B surface markers. You can see those there. People that have type AB blood have both because they're co-dominant. And you can see that here. They have both kinds of surface markers or surface receptors. And then people that have type O blood do not have either kind of surface or marker. So you know, see they have no surface markers on them. And our body will produce antibodies for whichever surface marker we do not have. Y'all remember from our uh, discussion of the immune system, antibodies were cells that help destroy foreign invaders. So in this instance of a person that has type A blood, they have A surface markers, and so they produce B antibodies so that they will recognize that B antigen or surface marker as a foreign invader. And if you'll look, the shape here of the antibody is different than the shape of the A receptor or surface marker. So these B antibodies are not going to go attack itself, okay, which is good. Somebody that has type B blood makes A antibodies Okay, and those A antibodies, okay, those would go and attack the A surface receptors. Okay, so the A antibodies are going to attack the A surface receptors. They will not attack the B. Somebody that has both A and B surface markers, they're not going to make any antibodies. Because if they made B antibodies, then they would attack their B receptors. If they made A antibodies, they would attack their A receptors. And, so we, and we don't want them to attack anything at all. Okay. So people that have type O blood, okay, people that type, have type O blood have no surface markers, so they make both kinds of antibodies. And so anything that comes into their body, they're ready to attack it. Okay. So your body knows what is foreign and what is not. Think of your antibodies are your defenders, okay, and your antigens, they're your, um, they're your markers, they're your sentries telling your defenders where to go and what to do. Okay, so let's look at the possible genotypes that somebody that has type A blood could have. So if somebody has type A blood, 
Okay, that means they have to have at least one of these dominant alleles. Okay, because A is a dominant allele in blood typing. So they could be dominant recessive, like we've talked about before with our complete dominance. Okay, or they could be homozygous. Big A, big I A, big I A. They cannot have that B allele anywhere in there though. Okay, otherwise that trait will be expressed because they're codominant. Okay, so people that have type B blood, they're going to be either IB, little i, or they're going to be IB, IB. People that have type A blood, or type AB blood, I'm sorry, their only option is to be IA, IB. If they have both of these surface markers, okay, if they are type AB blood, then they have to have both of those alleles. Okay, and people that are type O blood, they're not going to they're going to be recessive. Okay? They're not going to have an they cannot have any IAs or IBs. Otherwise, they would have some surface markers. When we're talking about blood type, the phenotype is the actual blood type of the person. So, for instance, somebody that has one of these two genotypes here, their phenotype is type A blood. Okay? So, IBI, IBIB, their phenotype is B. The phenotype here would be type AB blood. And the phenotype for little i, little i is going to be O. Okay, that's our phenotype there. So let's look at this blood cell here. Okay, so this blood cell here is a, um, this is going to be the phenotype, type A blood, right? That's my phenotype because I have an A antigen. So I've got an A phenotype here. So my body is going to make B antibodies, right? I want to be able to recognize B as a foreign invader. But I don't want it to be the same as my A because I don't want it to attack my A. So my body makes B antibodies. Okay? And my genotype here is either going to be IA, IA, or IA, little i. Let's look at this one here. So this one here is going to have a genotype, got to have a genotype of IA, IB, because they have both kinds of antigens or surface markers. So my phenotype is AB blood, and I'm going to make no antibodies here because I don't want to attack myself. Um, looking here at this one, okay, this one would be my phenotype of type O blood. Okay, I've got no surface markers, no antigens, which means my genotype has to be little i, little i, because this is recessive. And I'm going to make A and B antibodies. So I can attack anything that comes in that I do not recognize. So along that lines, let's talk for a second then about universal donor versus universal recipient. Okay, so if I have someone that is um, if I'm looking for some if I'm looking to be able to do a blood transfusion on someone, I need to match up their blood types so that I don't have a reaction. That reaction is called an agglutination reaction. Basically, it's a clumping as the person's antibodies attack the antigens on the new blood that was given to the person, then they all clump together and it blocks up the blood vessels. Okay? So it's called an agglutination reaction. So my universal donor, right? my universal donor is going to be somebody that can basically be a sneak attack, right? And that's going to be my type O blood. Okay? This is my blood that doesn't have any surface markers on it. Okay, so there's no surface markers on this blood cell. So I've got my type O blood, no surface on the marker on this blood cell, so it doesn't matter what antibodies someone has, the antibodies, no antibodies will attack that. We'll come back. Okay, so no antibodies will attack. Like I said, it's like a sneak attack. Nobody even knows it's there because there's no surface markers on it to make anything anybody notice it. 
So type O is what's considered my universal donor. So my universal recipient is actually going to be type AB blood. Okay, because AB blood has both types of antigens on it. Okay, so with somebody that has type AB blood, they've got both antigens on their surface of their cell, and so that means they don't have any um, they don't have any antibodies. So there are no antibodies in the recipient's blood. So even if somebody has surface markers, it won't matter because it won't attack them. Okay? So type, the universal donor is type O because no antibodies will attack it because it doesn't have any surface markers to trigger that. Our universal recipient is type AB blood because that does not have any AB, it doesn't have any antibodies in the recipient's blood. And so there's nothing to do the attacking. Essentially the blood is defenseless. So let's look at an example of how we could apply this with a Punnett square. So let's say I have a mom okay, that is type O blood and a son who is type a, and I want to know possibilities of the father. Okay, so if mom is type O, that means mom has to be little i, little i, right? Okay, and so my offspring go in the middle, right? So mom can only pass on a little i, so we know that. Okay, we know that the son is um, type A blood. So that means that type A dominant allele had to come from dad. So dad has to have at least one IA, right? Because this will give me type A blood, this will give me type A blood. Okay, and dad then, so dad could either be type A, dad could also be type AB blood. Because even if dad was type AB blood, Okay, if he was IAIB, the son still has a 50% 50 50 chance of being a type A blood. They still have the possibility of him being type A. So dad could either be A or AB. Dad could not be B, because if dad was B, then there'd be no way for the son to get that A allele. Okay, and if dad was type O, there would also be no way for the son to be type A. Let's do one more. Let's say mom is AB and dad is heterozygous type B. Um, what are the possibilities for the kids? Okay, well, plug that into my Punnett square, right? Mom is AB, which my genotype then for AB is IA, IB. So there's mom, IA, IB. Dad is heterozygous for type B, which means he's got to be, got to have two different alleles, so IB, I, IB, I versus little i. So my possibilities of the children then are all kinds of possibilities here, right? I've got a type AB possibility right here. I've got two type B possibilities right here or a type A possibility there. Okay, so we can apply this co-dominant situation with our regular Punnett squares. Okay, so let's look at what's called incomplete dominance. So incomplete dominance is usually best seen with coloring. Okay, we can almost consider it um, a blending. Okay, so co-dominance, both alleles are fully expressed. You know, you have A surface markers and B surface markers. Spots on a cow would be co-dominance. We had brown and white pigment both showing up. Okay. Um, with incomplete dominance, you essentially have um, what looks like a blending of the two traits. For instance, here, if I had red and white, and now I got pink flowers. Okay. Same with over here with the horses, my incomplete dominance. Okay. My horse colors here range from a cream to a dark brown, then I've got these varieties in between. 
Okay, so incomplete dominance is commonly seen in both skin and hair colorings. Okay, and so like I said, it'll appear like a blending. Stripes, spots, okay, those would be co-dominance. Um, varying shades of color, that would be incomplete dominance. So we can apply our incomplete dominance in the exact same way we've been doing with our other things. We just need to be sure that we are paying attention to whether the question said if it was incomplete or codominant. If it doesn't tell you that it's incomplete or codominant, you go ahead and you assume that it's regular complete dominance. Okay, so in this instance here, we're talking, let's keep up with those flowers. So I've got red, um, homozygous dominant being red, heterozygous being pink, um, homozygous recessive being white. And let's say I am crossing a red flower with a pink flower. And I want to know my probability, can't spell, I want to know my probability of white flowers. Okay, well I just apply my Punnett square, same as I did before, right? Gametes on the outside of the parent, there's the second parent, do my offspring in the middle, and my probability of having white flowers, and that's little r, little r, is zero out of four. There's no chance that those two flowers will produce a white flower. Okay, so it's the exact same as our regular monohybrids that we were doing. We just need to pay attention to whether this heterozygote here is a codominant or incomplete dominant situation. And it will tell you that in your problems. Let's look at one last thing to see if we can confirm as to which one we think is which. These are two kinds of chickens. One expresses um, codominance and one expresses incomplete dominance. Okay, and so the one on the right okay, is codominant. Okay, I can clearly see white and black feathers. The one on the left is incomplete dominance where I see what look like gray feathers. Okay, so like I said, you work your Punnett square in the exact same way. You make your gametes, you have your offspring, you make your predictions. You just need to pay attention to whether the trait is co-dominant or incompletely dominant. So we'll be working with this some more in class.